Hey everybody, welcome back to Rugby Wrap Up. Matt McCarthy at Studio 34 at the Fantasy Sports Network, and I have some massive guests today. We have the Titan, Mr. Stephen Lewis, the Elite Sevens coach here on the East Coast in New York City, former COO of Pro Rugby USA. Next to him is Mr. Mark Winokur the manager of Team Canada and also the manager of the Ontario Blues. We welcome him. And we have Mr. James Kennedy of the Murphy Kennedy Group, uh, who is a big supporter of rugby and may or may not be involved in a pro setup in the United States um, sometime soon. But we know that we're pressed for time, guys, with, especially with these two because they have day jobs. So, Mark, I want to thank you because without you, this show wouldn't be going on. Mark facilitated this show, the company he works for, uh, they were kind enough to give us some airtime, so thank you, my friend. Uh, blame me, sure, thanks. Yeah, well, get through, we just throw we start the bu- throwing under the bus right away. And by the way, just in case you didn't know, for the folks at home, that's the you're talking too much bell or you're misbehaving bell, and we hope we don't have to use it. And we can spon- we can use a sponsor for that bell as well. <laughs> you are our northern borders and important to USA Rugby as well. Tell us about the state of, of Rugby Canada right now. Well, you know, I don't think there's any short answer. There's no black and white definition. Obviously, disappointed with the result in the World Cup qualifier. But, you know, is the sky falling? You know, there are some things that would suggest no. Our U-20 team beat the U.S. by a similar score line to the senior team, only in reverse, uh, to qualify for the Junior World Trophy. Our, our club level uh, and senior re- regional level stuff is, is pr- continuing to, to produce decent results. So, you know, are there some systemic problems? Yes, uh, and I'm confident Rugby Canada will solve those. But, you know, is the sky completely falling? And no, I don't, I don't think so. What are a couple, three of the uh, systemic problems that you guys face? Well, listen, I mean, we live in a massive country where travel is very expensive and it's, it's all virtually impossible for us to assemble on a regular basis ahead of, of tests. Um, we don't have a pro league, which we need to work on. We, we probably need some work on our global scouting system. We don't have access to, to, to Polynesian players like some other countries do. And, and you know, these are things that, that we need to work on for sure. You know, we'll go back a couple of three years, and it was as though you guys were on the precipice of just blowing us, the United States, out of the stadium at, at particular times. It seemed like everything was in order. You had a Kiwi running the, the show, right? Um, and then it what it, it seemed to go uh, or stray a bit when you started focusing on the sevens team. You know that's that's possible. I mean, we may be trying to do too many things at at, at one time and being you know uh, doer of many and master of none. I, you know that's for other people to decide. Um, but I really think that the, you know some of the problem is just the group playing as the national team is in a, in a little bit of a confidence deficit right now, and nothing a couple of wins wouldn't solve. Uh, you know, as I say, the underpinnings seem to be sound, and, and eventually we will figure this out. And, and you know, the record in recent matches, I think, is it going on six or seven matches that Team USA has beaten Canada? But the matches have been pretty tight, except for the last one. And even that one was tight for an uncomfortable amount of time if you were a U.S. fan. Well, yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, they won five in a row. Then we had the draw in Hamilton, and then they won the last one. Um, but if you look at the 160-minute aggregate two-match series, it was after 134 minutes, it was 37-34. So, yeah. you know, they were clearly the better team in the last 26 minutes. But for the first 134, there was almost nothing between them. So, you know, which do you, which do you emphasize and which do you look at? Uh, obviously, there's some self-reflection we have to do. But, you know, it, as I say, I don't think the sky is falling. And you did have a great result against the Glendale Raptors with the Ontario Blues. And the Glendale Raptors are considered one of the top teams in this country. You have to have satisfaction out of that. Well, you know, I, I think the idea of that match, you know, I talked to Mark Bullock about that. And we set that up between the two of us was to have two of the you know more successful sub international programs play each other and uh, it was a terrific game I've, I've had great feedback from it and you know the, a logical thinking person would think uh, that Ontario might make a good candidate for uh, participation in pro rugby in some iteration in the near future and uh, you know those those discussions are happening and so we'll maybe something like a major league rugby set up in the future for for maybe a Toronto or an Ontario based franchise? Sure. I mean, I think, you know, no one would dispute that we need to get more of our pay- players into a pro setup and get them paid and and you know, whatever the quickest path and, and the most viable path to do that, we're going to we're going to look at hard, sure. So speaking of logical thinking people, Mr. James Kennedy, James, your your name is always coming up about pro- professional rugby here on the East Coast, New York City specifically. You, you you tried with the Pro 12, it didn't work out for you and your group, now maybe the MLR or something else. 
it, it might work out to be a smart thing to have if you have a professional setup coming in or to maybe get some exhibition matches against the Ontario Blues or the like of that? Yeah, it definitely makes sense that the the support is here in New York. I mean, we've got stadium backing now, so and we're working our facilities. I mean, Steve is coming on board to help out with that. Um, and a, and a lot of we're going to Denver next week to look at Glendale. So, um, and then Ontario, Chicago, Boston are all interested. And I think if we can get some some tournaments or some friendly games next year, or some cup games, we could really get some in interest going and get the players excited. So you just specifically named some of the MLR franchises in Glendale and Chicago. and, and Well, there is no MLR franchise in Chicago right. at this point. That's a good point. That's a very good point. So Not in our Boston. But hopefully you were... <laughs> no, <laughs> nor Ontario. Uh, nor no, Ontario. <laughs> or nor New York. So. <laughs> but, All right. Well, so... But, but yeah, it's it, the interest is there. Everybody's there, and it's a matter of uh, getting everybody excited and committed to moving forward. I mean, the the exciting thing about an, a northeast conference in whatever professional league setup it is is the travel time is less. Uh, we can bust the games, cutting down costs, and generating local rivalries, which is always um, a big a bonus. Can you, know? you tell us a little bit about the um, stadium setup that might be happening in New York? Well, I'm, we're talking to three stadiums, so um, I, I think to mention stadiums at this point would be a bit early but we're talking to three stadiums and we have we have a, f a first choice second choice and third choice so the ball is in our court all right so you heard it here first we've got uh, two professional franchises in toronto and new york <laughs> with uh, mark and ken kennedy running him now that's all that's what's well, a hope anyway it's a hope and uh, they didn't say no and on that note uh, we'll have to bid them adieu because they do have to get back to the day jobs uh, and we appreciate your time mark thank you man. james we'll come Thanks, back man. with steve lewis uh, and two special guests that have been on the Eagles right after this. This is Saban Doxy, and you're watching RugbyWrapUp.com. Yes. Michael Petrie, three-time Rugby World Cup scrum half for Team USA's men's Eagles. What do you make of this high school rugby national championship here in Kansas City? It's an amazing atmosphere. It's an amazing tournament. I mean, the organizers did a fantastic job. So much support from so many different people. I mean, you know, sponsors like the Murphy Kennedy Group just really are what make this happen. And you know, the athleticism on display here is uh, is only a testament to how how far we've come as a rugby nation. The future is very bright for rugby in our country for sure. Hey everybody, Matt McCarthy back at Studio 34 for the Fantasy Sports Network and Rugby Wrap-Up. And we have some new guests up here with us right now. Steve, Mr. Steve Lewis, is now joined by Lara Vivolo, the uh, legend of the New York Rugby Club and a capped USA Eagle and the current head coach. Assistant coach. The, the, the current assistant coach, soon to be the head coach <laughs> after this show, of the Army women's team. And we have Mr. Nate Augsburger who is the captain of Team USA recently against Ireland, right? Yes, sir. He's an eagle. He's an old blue player. And we're going to find out exactly what an Augs Perger is uh, just after we start talking to Lara. Lara, uh, your your bio in rugby is impressive. Um, but you started in a, in a roundabout way playing rugby. You went to the University of Court. You went to SUNY Cortland. SUNY Cortland. Uh, give a holla for SUNY Buffalo, SUNY yeah. Cortland. How you doing? But you didn't like the coach of which team? Basketball. The basketball team. So you went and had a four-year great swimming career. Correct. And your brother talked you into playing rugby. Yes, he was playing at SUNY Oneonta. And he said, you're big, you're strong, you like to run. So why don't you go try out for the rugby team? I said, okay, and never look back. Yeah, so uh, looking back now, we can see what a, what, a, what a, an accomplished career it was. You joined uh, the New York Rugby Club right there, the New York Rugby Club corner, uh, making Steve cringe. New York Rugby Club, uh, you had two national championships with the New York Rugby Club. You had nine caps. With nine caps with the, the USA. With the 15s mm -hmm. program. You also played with the, the Atlantis squad. Yes, right? it's a lot of fun playing sevens when you're fit, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've never had that. Uh, World Cup, fifth place with Team USA. Yep, fifth place in 2010 out of 12 countries, and it was an incredible experience. I wish we had made top four, but uh, it wasn't in our cards. What was your year. favorite experience as a player? Uh, I would say World Cup. World Cup and winning uh, the first national championship with New York in 2006. You also were on a whole bunch of, you won the ITTs, rather. We did, back in the yeah. day when it was called the ITTs, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and for the folks at home, if you could tell us what that acronym stands for, uh, you'll get a, a date with Steve Lewis for coffee <laughs> here in Manhattan Damn. on him. Uh, I think you guys know about the bill. All right, so Nate, uh, we're going to catch up. Well, for, first, Steve, 
You're coaching with Lara at Army. That's and, correct. Yeah. So how is she as a coach? Tremendous. Great, um, great attitude, great uh, presence, and really sort of connects with the players very well. Um, she asks a lot of questions, and so I have to come up with a lot of answers and be prepared. But Do so you know the answers to the questions that she asks you? Most of them. Most of them. So it's, it's been good. It's been great working with her and Bill LeClerc, who's the head coach there as well. If you had to critique her coaching style or you had to label it after somebody that you know or the folks out there know, well, who would you say? Or what would you say? With the, what was A, the critique, and B, what her style is like? I think that's for another time, Matthew. I don't Ooh. think that's appropriate for this Ooh. venue. Steve clamming up again on camera. It's a talk show, guys. It's a talk show. He's still my mentor, so. All right. It's good. You've always been very diplomatic, Lara. <laughs> uh, biggest transition for you going from player on a high level to coaching? Uh, well, first of all, every time I saw the pitch, I still wanted to be on it playing. So that was a big change for me. Um, it's challenging, you know. It's just changing the mentality from thinking like a player to thinking like a coach. Um, not thinking like a tight five player, but thinking, you know, as a coach who can coach one through fifteen. Um, and every day that I'm out there, I'm learning something new, and it's uh, it's been a great process. And I'm excited for the future. And I finished my first year with Army, so I'm really excited to start the second season, and continue to learn as much as I can from Steve and Bill Clerk. So, so far, so good. In um, comparison to when you were playing college rugby, what are these players like? Wow. Um, very different uh, from SUNY Cortland back in 1995. Um, they're just, they're amazing cadets and individuals. They're disciplined. Um, you know, they're academics. They work really hard in the classroom and they come down to our rugby complex and they're just focused and tuned in and want to learn as much as they can because many of them are brand new players and so they haven't played before. Yeah, I would be remiss if I didn't salute Mr. Cortland Rugby, Brian Stretch Humphreys, who's back up there in Del Mar, uh, <laughs> Albany, right? Yeah. All right. Uh, Nate, first nope. off, uh, what's with the hat? What is the hat? <laughs> it's a nice hat. It goes with my outfit. You know, I so like wearing snapback hats. Fashion hats. statement? Fashion statement, fashion definitely. Fashion statement. Yeah. I should have worn a Minnesota Vikings hat, honestly, but so, I didn't you, go with that. Are you outfit. from Minneapolis? <laughs> yeah, Minneapolis, that's <laughs> correct. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, there's a 20 buck bet between Steve Lewis and James Kennedy that Steve could get Minneapolis mentioned in here. All right, so you're from Minnesota. Your favorite movie is Fargo. Uh, <laughs> you played for the Golden Gophers, but your dad played rugby and got you into, into rugby, so that's interesting. That's right, yeah. My, uh, my dad was a college football player. Um, when he was done, he ended up moving to Minnesota and started playing rugby. A bunch of his buddies got him out. And so as a kid, I grew up... Uh, just a round of rugby ball, and it was uh, yeah, it was awesome. And Dude, what was uh, what was your first game? How old were you when you played in your first rugby game? My first organized rugby game, I was eleven. Um, my dad and his teammates, they all had kids around the same age, so they taught us all how to play. Ended up finding some team up north that we could have a run against, and it was a lot like watching uh, eight-year-olds play soccer, just everyone chasing after sure, the same yeah, ball. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, was it tackle or touch? It was tackle, yeah. At 11? Yeah. Good, so right out of the gate you were tackling. Yeah. What position? Um, I was, I mean, we didn't, we didn't really have positions at that point, but I started on the wing. So pretty much everybody starts on the wing. Everybody right? starts on I the wing. I started fullback and then went to wing. I so. do. I do know a guy that started at hooker, though. And it's like I was like, were you trying to kill the guy? He must have been a big guy, though. You no, know, no, he really wasn't. But all right. So, <laughs> um, Golden Gophers, Twin Cities Rugby. Uh, you transitioned into the 15s program as a sevens player. Yeah. Right. Correct. And you actually got to travel with the squad to Rio for the Olympics. Yep, I was a traveling reserve with the squad. It wow. was a great experience. Wow, that had to be awesome. Yeah, it was. It really was. It was fun to be there. Um, a lot of work was put in with that with that entire team. Um, I was a part of a lot of the tours and stuff, so I was really in the heart of it. So to be able to see it all the way through the Olympics was just, yeah, it was a great opportunity. All right, we're going to take a quick break, but I want you to think about having Mike Friday as the next 15s head coach, and I want to talk to you about that right after these words. After witnessing firsthand the crimes against refereeing that were committed on behalf of the British and Irish Lions, Jonathan Wicklow Barbary sought out referee Greg Gilliam. What he found was shocking. The referee's life is a lonely life. You don't have any friends. You're deaf, dumb, and blind. Is that accurate? An idiot? Dopey? Missed the great call? <laughs> no. Use your good eye because you're blind as a... You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. You're almost as fit as the players, which are half your age. Yeah, you have to be as, just as fit as your, your customers, your players, yeah. How come you're not wearing your Coke bottle glasses? Where's your hearing aid? It's Back to your fitness. Yeah, do a lot of upper body. Star jumps karaoke? No, no, nothing like that. Dead man carry? Press-ups? Put press-ups. Frog kicks? 
I'm not sure what frog kicks are, but I'm sure. I'll show you off camera. We're going to leave you alone because you're used to being alone. And quite frankly, after speaking to you, you deserve to be alone. <laughs> Thank you, Jonathan Wiglow Barbary. And we're back. Matt McCarthy at Studio 34 for Rugby Wrap-Up at the Fantasy Sports Network. I have Mr. Stephen Lewis, Miss Laura Vivolo, and Mr. Nate Augsburger here. Uh, Nate, we left you with a cliffhanger and the folks at home. How about Mike Friday as the next head coach for the 15th program? Uh, Mike Friday is a great coach. Uh, I back him. Um, I think he's done a really a lot of positive stuff with the sevens, obviously. And he actually did spend some time with us on the on the 15s um, back in November. He, uh, he was on the staff, he was our attack coach, and um, he was teaching a lot of really good stuff, which also leads me to believe he knows what kind of culture and what kind of team we've been able to build since then uh, under Mitch and Marty and, and Phil Greeny. And so he, he's, uh, he's, he's one of those guys I would consider a part of the, part of the dream team of coaching, sure. so to speak. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so he, he fits right in there. So if you were a gambling man, and let's take, let's take Coach Friday out of the equation because he's pretty, pretty well ensconced in the sevens program right now. Um, who would you say are the top three candidates? Well, if I were to gamble, I'd probably have to say that it would be Todd Clever, Blaine Scully, or somebody else. I don't know. Honestly, I, honestly, I don't know. I'm just kind of taking is, everything with stride. Is that breaking news that Blaine Scully is now retired as well as Todd? No. <laughs> All right, I didn't think so. Yeah, that, that would be news to Scully. <laughs> Uh, Steve, you want to touch upon this topic of the head coach, the next head coach for Team USA? Sure. I mean, the, um, the job description went out about three days ago, so or four days ago, and so um, I'm sure the applications are piling up in uh, Lafayette or wherever the national office is these days. Um, you know, obviously, a national team coaching job is a prestigious job, both for anyone in American rugby and also for international coaches, particularly now that they have actually qualified for the World Cup. So I'm sure there'll be a plethora of interesting candidates um, and be remiss to prejudge um, who has applied, who has not applied. So you're not going to take a stab at guessing because that was the question that you're evading right now. Absolument pas, as we French-speaking Scotsmen say. <laughs> uh, okay, all right. So, Lara, any, any ideas on who the next men's uh, 15s coach will Two be? Two words, Julie McCoy. For the men's team? Sure, why All not? Right. She's qualified. She has a lot of experience, and I have I admire her. She's been in my life for a long time as a coach and a friend. You got another choice? <sighs> I haven't thought about that. Um, not sure. Oh, you know what else I wanted to bring up while what, what we're talking about? Um, well, you brought up a woman coach, right? Uh, there was a great article in Prospect Magazine uh, written by Sheena Harrington uh, about how women's sports, specifically rugby and soccer, are never on the back page of any major publications. And she went through a whole list of, of uh, publications and there were dozens and dozens of men's articles and men's back, sto back page stories and there was nothing for the women on the back page and there were 13 columns total. What do you think the women have to do to get on a back page? I mean, it's disappointing to hear that, but it's the reality of what we have right now. Um, you know, I just think that they have to keep working hard and try and be in the forefront and just do great things in their sport, like, you know, Serena Williams and, and these athletes who are just top of their game. Um, keep getting more people to watch, watch them play, watch their sports, and just have more interest. Did you feel as a, a, a member of a team that came in fifth in a Rugby World Cup that perhaps you'd be further along now? Yes, it is disappointing to see. Um, I've had that conversation with many friends and former coaches and, you know, I don't know what uh, Nate and I were talking about it but before we came here, but, you know, in some ways the women's game has moved forward, but in some ways it's moved backwards. And, you know, I'm not sure how we have to get the puzzle all together, but the pieces are there and hopefully we can figure it out in the next couple of years. You know, you, you bring up a point about moving backward. Uh, Nate, last year at this time, we were in the middle of the inaugural Pro Rugby USA season. The Ohio Aviators lost on points to the Denver Stampede. As a player, where you're at your level right now, captain of Team USA against Ireland, a, a, a top nation. Uh, even though players were missing for the for the Lions, that's still a very very tough squad. How does it impact your daily thinking and your commitment to the Eagles, not knowing the what the professional climate is? Because Quite frankly, you're not going to make a million bucks right now playing for the Eagles. Yeah, no. So how does that impact your daily daily thinking and your daily life? Well, it makes it tougher. Um, being a domestic guy uh, with 
without any professional avenue uh, it makes it a lot tougher you just kind of have to figure out where you can get the resources so where where you can train at the elite level how you level. pay the rent how you, yeah well and that's the reality too a lot of guys get to my age I'm, I'm 27 and they really have to pick it or choose whether they want to keep playing rugby for USA or whether they need to focus on a real job some domestic guys already have day jobs um, luckily enough for me, I, I do enough play rugby stuff that I kind of can, you know, do that part time and still focus on my stay uh, float a bit. So yeah, stay float and, and focus on my rugby career. Um, but yeah, it just it just makes it tougher. You just have to dig a little bit deeper. You have to fight and claw for for where you can get your opportunities to even get the experience that's needed to really shine at the international level. So. Steve, what about a guy like this? What 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 advice do you give him to life after rugby, or or now, as a matter of fact, when everything's still in the balance? You know, we 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 have the MLR um, potentially coming along. Uh, Doug Schoeninger, who was on here last week, uh, doesn't seem to think his organization's going away. He seems to think he's going to be back on the pitch. Uh, what advice? What, what do you tell a guy like this? Well, Nate's uh, pretty much at the peak of his game, you know, so he's, he's playing well, performing well, and just getting the first couple of years of top international experience. So the future's still bright for Nate. Um, how and where does he play? So in the, you know, the best of possible world, he would get a, a contract offer in Europe or elsewhere. So that's what he's working for, and he, he's, he's doing everything right in order to get that. How about residency with the Sevens or... I think Nate's in the, in the mode now, he can speak for himself, obviously, where he's concentrating on 15s. Um, he, he's done the 7s thing, potentially could go back to 7s. He's good enough to do that. Is that right? You're you're um, looking at 15s now instead of 7s? or? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I enjoy being being a part of, uh, what would you call it, a, a remote guy, uh, being able to do my thing out here. And uh, I, I'd have no problem linking up with the 7s team towards the World Cup or whatever it may be. But, you know, I enjoy being a domestic guy who, who has – his options open to uh, other 15s opportunities and stuff right now. It's definitely a focus of mine. But but the the, the answer, the solution there is that we do have a better intermediate, uh, semi-pro or pro domestic league. That's what we need to work towards in order to give these guys the opportunities. So it's not just eight guys who get foreign contracts, but we have 150 yeah. guys playing within the U.S. Yeah. And the women. And the women as well, yes. And on that note, we're going to take our, our last break and come back uh, with – these folks after this. So this is the 10th anniversary of the NYC Rugby Cup, which is hard to believe. Um, it's come a long way. Um, I think we've got over 60 teams here today and they're all kitted out, uh, representing different teams from across the country. We've always had a theme every year and this is the culminating event for our partner programs and our community programs that work with us throughout the year to come and showcase their skills and their go forward attitude as well. So it's uh, super exciting to be celebrating the 10th anniversary. Thanks to AIG and Canterbury for supporting us, all the volunteers, all the sponsors, and especially the staff and volunteers. Some fantastic rugby, uh, lots of sportsmanship, the kids still had a blast. And now, of course, now we've finished, the sun has come out. So um, that's the way it goes, I guess. Every day's a rugby day. Hey everybody, Matt McCarthy back at Studio 34 for the Fantasy Sports Network and Rugby Wrap-Up. So Nate, if there's an MLR setup and a Pro Rugby USA setup, which would you rather play in? Oh man, I think I'd have to take the uh, MLR route at this point. How uh, come? I got a lot of teammates who are part of that Pro Rugby thing and uh, the way everything blew over, I don't know if I'd trust being a part of it to be honest but That's a good point um it was a great competition it was real enjoyable to watch I, I know a lot of people who followed it a lot of guys who were a part of that enjoyed the rugby aspect just uh some of the other stuff so why weren't you part of that was there a certain um guy at this table that didn't pick you to be part of that or was it a different <laughs> choice i think it was a different <laughs> choice i think that guy would have picked me Steve, I, I, I picked him for quite a few teams by now. You know, Old Blue, Northeast, <laughs> no, but, no, any team I can pick him but for. But was he on the? What was the story there? Yeah, I was what? on the way to the Olympics, man. Yeah, he, was a, Nate was Olympic <laughs> season. Well, you didn't say that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. he was a little busy training, yeah. tra training for Rio. <laughs> yeah, Nate was heavily involved with um, sevens, obviously. But what you've got to remember is that those five um, franchises in pro were geographically located a lot further yeah. west to here. So yeah. when you talked about players, there were lots of good players in New York, both. Clubs like Old Blue and AC and also Mystic, who are of the quality, who could have played and who could potentially play in an MLR-type scenario here, 
but uh, it just wasn't feasible or practical to have them especially with that, that budget yeah, yeah especially yeah yeah and I think the MLR is going to face the same problem yeah, I mean, you've got to remember, 40% of American rugby players are between Boston and D.C. So, I mean, this is a real geographical area of strength. So, that any sustainable professional league has to be in, A, New York, the biggest media market. Yeah. Uh, Boston, Philly, Toronto. These are all places where any budding league would want to be. It's where the players are. It's where the media market is. And they are logical choices for any, any setup that comes forward. Lots of fans, too. In this area, East yeah, Coast. I mean, and we have, and we have a ton of youth rugby, mm-hmm. right? We have all these. We got Play Rugby USA, which is, is doing great things. Mm-hmm. We've got the high school setups. New York Rugby's got the the, the high school, U, yep. yeah, the U nineteen, U nineteens, right? right? And uh, Old Blues delving in some of the kids stuff now, aren't they? Oh, well, Play Rugby is. Uh Pretty much. Oh, is Old Blue now? T- no, Old Blue, typical no. Old Blue move. They're taking no. credit for the Play Rugby USA <laughs> program. Just Not saying, like the New York Rugby <laughs> Club, the oldest club in the United States, which actually has a U19 program. Now, all these clubs contribute in their own inimitable manner, and it's a good thing. And we're in a very, uh, we're in a lucky space in New York because there's a lot of great people involved in rugby at every level. All right. Well, you know, my, my favorite quote from this show so far, I mean, the show, all episodes. Indisputable. Is, Indisputable. No. That's the quote. Favorite quote is, I was on my way to the Olympics, man. (laughs) Come on. That that really much says everything, right? Uh, You were on your way to play rugby in the Olympics or at least have a shot at it. I was trying to, yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, What's it going to take for you to continue chasing the dream? Uh, Well, what's the dream first? In the next five years... In a perfect world, what is your rugby career? And what's it going to take to keep you pursuing that in terms of sacrifice? That's a, that's a long time, Matt. Uh, most, most of us in this position, we kind of have to take it a, a couple months at a time. So I'll, I'll give you kind of my goals and, and what I hope for, I guess, over the next year, year or two leading up to World Cup 2019, which, which I hope to be a part of with the USA 15s team. And I think over the... On the lead up to that, I think uh, USA 15s has never been ranked in the world top 10. Um, I think that's a realistic goal that we can achieve. Um, We'll have matches in November that will help us move up in the world rankings, and there will be more matches hopefully um, as they get scheduled throughout throughout the next couple years um, leading up to the World Cup. So for for the USA 15s team, I would like to be a part of of that process going forward and and being top 10 in the World Cup. So... um, making more history so to speak um for this for the usa team which is important if i can just continue over the next if you were to say five years if i can just continue to uh leave a legacy uh, a legacy that's worthwhile a legacy that that um shows the identity and the character of what what an eagle should be um and, and continue to create belief in in our team and our players and i have a lot of belief in myself so i really think i can achieve those things and all the while of competing for our USA 15s team without any professional setup, I hope that I personally can get involved in a overseas professional league and um, continue to build a rugby career that actually puts a lot more uh, money in my pockets and food on the table and allows me to kind of um, you know uh, build a family and stuff like that. So that, that's kind of how I, I would take it. And as long as I keep co- believing in myself and believing what I'm capable of and, and what USA is capable of, I think that'll steer me in the right direction so good stuff lara if you were still playing rugby and you didn't see any of the opportunities presenting themselves for pro rugby would you continue the grind yeah i mean if i was still able to play and i was young enough and fit enough and had the time um it's just it's a huge part of my life it's 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 a passion that i want to be involved in in any way so i would definitely still be playing um, if I was playing club for New York, you know, they, they won their first national championship 2006. They won in 2010 and 2011. And then for a couple of years, they weren't in the top four. So they've made themselves, they've gotten back up into the top four in the country, but they haven't won since 2011. So. And we were well represented in that USA versus the WPL match. Yes, we were. We right. had, what, five, six girls who were yeah. playing for both teams, which was great. But uh, Steve, how many women did the old blue team have in the, oh. In oh, the in the WPL versus team I think USA you know the match. answer to that. Old blue women how tend many? to concentrate on sevens, so I think uh, that would be uh, so that was zero. That would That'd be, be the yardstick. <laughs> that would be zero. But you didn't you didn't ask me actually, Matt, if I could bring up about playing. You know, it's been some time since <laughs> yeah, I played. Yeah, ask Stevie, see what he says. 
Yeah, I'm, I may be making a comeback Steve, here in the, uh, uh, in the, in the it, veterans well, department. Uh, you know what? What about what about uh, gold professional old boys? Yeah, well, that's what I'm going to say. I mean, it, I will throw down the challenge. You know, if I got to mark you, I would take you on any time. Oh, I'll play oh. any time. <laughs> yeah, my, the gauntlet again, has you know, been thrown. Just like Joe Kelly, my cleat Clean. marks will be all oh. over your chest. That's a okay. Big, all over. Clean get pair of heels. Do, all do, you clear the seen, tracks. Buddy. Here comes the McCarthy Express. Get off the tracks, Lois. <laughs> I would pay to see I'm that. Petrified. A lot of petrified. Rake, a lot of raking going on in Please, that game. Please, I am too dumb to be petrified. All right, <laughs> and I'm still playing. By the way, okay. How you doing? How you doing? All right. Well, we're we're not going to talk about my my storied professional career. We'll have your uh, old boy games. We'll have Steve Thompson, my ex coach, tell you about my career as a as a rugby player. You sucked last year. You suck this year, and you'll suck next year. Was his quote. <laughs> a more su- a more succinct definition at a halftime talk I've never heard. Yeah, no, that probably was accurate as well. That was good. He also called me the second worst winger in club history, despite the fact that I was playing center and we were winning by 19 points. It's a good thing he believed in you, Matt. Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And he thought I was somebody else because uh, he was a Maori eight man and didn't know anything about backs, or he just hated them. But all right, we're we're getting high. We're getting hijacked here. Uh, I want to thank you guys uh, for coming on. It's been great. Again, the show flies by. Uh, I'm going to go out. Speaking of fly, I'm going to go get a fly hat like that. Um, Steve, with your uh, your continued success coaching the Sevens people across the United States and across this great world. Lara, it's great to see that you're coaching. It's always great to have your smile Thanks, around. Thanks, Matt. Good to see you, too. And Nate, best of luck. And, and we just got to fill in Scully that he's now retired. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. And I just want to salute the, the storied career of Todd Clever because he's talking about a long time. Todd Clever, you played till, till you were 34. Awesome. Retired on your own terms. And you played, you didn't play wing. You played a very physical position for a very long time. Kudos. Congrats. On behalf Love of Steve you, Lewis. <laughs> Love you, TC. On behalf of uh, Steve Lewis, Laura Vivolo, and Nate Augsburger, which we still haven't found out what an Augsburger is, Matt McCarthy from Studio 34 at the Fantasy Sports Network for Rugby Wrap-Up, signing off.